Hello, and welcome to episode two of Spinal Cast. I'm your host, David Stevens, and joining us today is Tiffany Carlson. Tiffany is an executive director at Spinalpedia, and joining me as co-host is Rich Sluice. Tiffany, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. How are you guys? Doing well, and yourself? Just fine. It is the middle of the week, so, you know, I could be better, but I'm doing okay. I feel you. I feel you. So we're going to take uh, today's episode to ask you some questions about um, your experience with spinal cord injury and, um, you know, your injury itself and kind of what has all gone along with it. And so um, if you're uh, comfortable with it, I think we'll just go ahead and jump in. Let's do it. Absolutely. All right. Be fun. Perfect. So um, from my notes, it, it sounds like your injury took place in 1993. Um, and you were how old at the time? I was 14. Yes. 14. Wow. wow. Um, w- yep. Is there any, would you be willing to just kind of give us a, a rundown of the accident and kind of what what happened? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, it's a diving accident. And like, you know, a lot of people, I misjudged the depth of the water. I knew kind of how deep it was, but I was a little incorrect, but it was just a silly accident. And I was there with friends just hanging out. And unfortunately, that's the kind of thing that happens um, on water a lot, you know. And for me, it was right before I was about to start my ninth grade year at high school. So that was really hard. Um, But yeah, the injury itself was super scary. I almost died, actually, because when I broke my neck, I couldn't get out of the water. And my friends had no idea that I actually was injured at that moment. So I did um, drown and I was get resuscitated there on the, it was very scary. So yeah. And so I am just grateful to be alive. And because of that injury, I think um, I didn't have no near death experience though, but when I was uh, resuscitated, cause I knew when I broke my neck in the water, I must've been paralyzed cause I couldn't get out of the water. And then I, ran out of air. It was the most scariest thing of my life. And I definitely have PTSD from that. But yeah. And so all these years later, it's crazy. It's been 30 years next year. It'll be 30 wow. years. So, Who? But yeah, getting injured also at 14 is, I think, a difficult time to get injured. Yeah, for sure. that's a tough time. Did one of your friends rescue? How did you get rescued, Tiffany? Who actually helped get you out? Uh, I just one of the kids that was there kind of figured out that, oh, maybe she needs help. And then there was another woman there, my aunt, actually, who was there with her kids. And she knew CPR. So luckily, my aunt was there and was able to give me CPR. And then they called, of course, the ambulance. And then I was sent to the hospital. And when you break your neck, usually they do surgery like within hours, which is what happened to me to stabilize your neck area, right? Yeah. So that's what happened. And so, yeah, it's a big, huge situation. And I was in the hospital for about three months. In the first month, I was in ICU. Mm-hmm. So did you know the moment that you you struck the bottom that it was a bad injury? Or were you aware? Were you? Um, I think um, a lot of people don't remember the impact, and I didn't either. You don't really remember that part. Um, you just kind of wake up kind of after a concussion kind of situation, and then you just kind of wake up in the water. So I don't actually remember hitting that exact moment. Right. So sorry. No, that's okay. Right. I was just – I was interested. So um, I guess how long did it take then for you to recognize that this was, um, you know, an injury that was going to last um, longer than, than – just the immediate future you know it's not like a broken arm where you're going to heal right away well a spinal cord injury is diagnosed usually with this uh cat scan and mri upon arrival at the er and when they see the broken neck with the injury to the spinal cord that's all they need to see and they can know right away that'll be a paralyzing injury it's all about the bone going into the spinal cord and you can see that very clearly even on an x-ray so Mm. mm mm-hmm I know you were, you said you were young when this happened. Do you think that made it harder um, than if you would have been older, clearly, than? Uh, you know, for a long time, I thought that was the case. I'm like, yeah, I think at that transitional age from going from kid to teenager and wanting to do everything that teenagers do. And I thought, man, that must be the hardest time. But I, you know, writing about people who are paralyzed for my job now for all these years. And I've talked to a lot of people who get hurt in their thirties and forties and fifties. 
And that's hard too. Mm -hmm. And so, cause they go through a whole other kind of situation where they have to deal with their spouses dealing with their new injury and like all of that. And that can be hard. And a lot of divorces happen. So I don't really know if I would say like 14 is like the hardest for sure, but it's definitely one of the harder ages. I mean, I mean, it's always difficult. I think no matter the age, it's hard. Five, 10, 15. It's, it's a hard thing, no matter the age for sure. Yeah. What do you, what do you think the hardest part of, of, hearing about that and, and knowing what you were going to be dealing with, uh, what was the hardest I part? think at the time, you're just so mad at yourself for the injury. Cause for me, I was self-inflicted. And I think for a lot of people, they always kind of go back going, God, what could I have done differently? And so you have this whole like anger at first. And then, you know, I don't think it's really easy to understand like the gravity of the situation at my age too. You know, the doctors tell you, oh yeah, you're going to be paralyzed now and you're going to need to use a wheelchair and everything. And you're like, oh, okay. And so, but you start thinking about everything you're missing and then you realize as the months and then years go by how much you really are missing out. But at the time, at the very moment, I think it's kind of hard to understand everything. I was just dealing with trying to get out of the bed and into a power chair finally because I was going stir crazy sitting in that bed for like a month and a half. Can't and imagine. I just wanted to move around. But yeah, it really was very, very hard. And I th would say for sure going back to high school and starting high school in a power chair was, was – really, really, really hard for me. I was very depressed, like very depressed. And so I struggled with a lot of just like self-esteem issues for at least two years until I realized that, oops, sorry. I realized that, um, that, you know, there was kind of a hope kind of situation because I met other people with, who finally were disabled at a summer camp through Camp Courage mm -hmm. and meeting other people who were doing things that I didn't think I could do was like really, really huge for me. And since there was no social media at the time, I really didn't have like any kind of idea that a, a life that I had always wanted would still be reachable because I didn't see that happening mm -hmm. for me until I finally met people and like in 1995 or six I met some people but yeah the high school years were pretty hard the first couple of years for sure I just didn't feel like I fed it fit in and I was always the only person in the room in a wheelchair and when you're always the only person who's in a wheelchair in a room you always feel a little bit like you're the odd person out. It's just how it is. And so you try to get used to it and but I was never popular in high school anyways. So I kind of was used to being a loner and that's definitely how it was when I kind of went back to high school, you know? Well, that's uh, unfortunate to hear. Um, but I, I guess okay, my question was, did you recognize differences with any of your friends that you, you did have in high school after the injury? Was it more difficult for um, you to spend time with them? Were they not inviting you to the things that they normally would? Was there, I have a feeling it would just, create kind of an odd barrier that no one would have expected. Um, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people with paralysis experience what I did, which is basically you kind of lose a lot of your friends, which is what happened to me. I really didn't think my friends knew how to deal with my situation. Yeah. So they just were being nice, but it was also just very like level one where it wasn't like deep, like it was before where you're actually friends yeah. and knowing what's going on so and they're so young yeah it was pretty right? hard I mean, and so I ended up becoming friends with some disabled people in my high school just because I felt like they were the only people who could really get me you know yeah. so well that I mean as as you know negative as that situation is at least it sounded like all of you guys made a positive out of it and made your own friend group out of out of like-minded people, right? Yeah, it's good to have peers that, you know, can relate to you. And that's a huge thing after being paralyzed is, you know, you need to find a peer mentor, find a peer group that people that are also paralyzed or have disabilities or something that you can kind of understand, you know, and we, um, and that there's a lot of groups in like rehab facilities now where if you're newly injured, you they recommend if you're even an, an outpatient, you should come hang out with these people like once a week just to talk and understand what they're going through. So you don't feel so alone in the struggle because when you get sent home and you're, it's great to go home, but you're the only disabled person now around your whole community mm -hmm. really is how it feels. And so you don't really, and you, and you are a different person, you know, and everyone does this, will admit that, you know, you kind of are reborn after a spinal cord injury. You really aren't the same person that you were before because 
you just aren't. <laughs> and so you are going to just become, you know, maybe have new friends and that, and that's okay. But there is definitely the, that two year trend three, maybe even longer for some people the the transition to realizing that you're going to maybe lose some friends and but make new friends and you're going to be looked at differently and you're going to have to kind of realize your identity is different. That whole thing is so hard. And, um, but yeah, it's hard, but you can see like, you know, uh, a really good example of what I'm talking about is that wheelchair dance group online called the Rolettes. They're really cute. And they have, um, they talk a lot about like female empowerment and coming together as women who use wheelchairs and how it was so important for them to find each other after their injuries, because you just don't really feel pretty anymore. You don't feel like you fit in and all this stuff. And they're all younger women in their twenties. And I love seeing what they're doing now online. Cause that's what I would have needed back in the 90s. And so I'm so glad they're doing that now because it was re it's really needed. So, oh, th yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I was going to say, too, I have two young daughters. And as a parent, mm -hmm. you know, if that happened to one of my girls, I'm, I would have a hard time not being able to control the situation or, or do something to make it better. Uh, could you just talk about your family and how, how that played out with them and how it affected them? Um, my family, unfortunately, weren't like millionaires, so they couldn't send me overseas to do stem cells or that kind of thing like a lot of parents are able to do for their kids. But um, but they did the best they could. You know, it was really hard, obviously, to see their you know child go through this paralysis. I know my parents had just recently before I got injured, they had just gotten divorced. So I was kind of glad in a way that had happened. So I because sometimes divorces happen and it gets really hard for the family when the kid comes home and they're paralyzed. But for me, that wasn't the case. And my mom was just recently married to my stepdad. And so they were dealing with their new marriage. And then I was this new, you know, 14 year old home with paralysis. And I know it was really hard for them. And I, you know, you do feel a lot of guilt too. I think a lot of people do when you're paralyzed, whether it's for, you know, you feel guilt because your kids, you know, have a different parent for me at the time. I had this fantasy that I wanted to like go up the stairs and like get out of bed and put my, you know, this one dress I had on and like surprise my mom and go, hi, I'm better. Yeah. You know, I had this fantasy and I really would, I would pray to God. I'm like, why? But, you know, that's just how the balls roll, you know. And so I, I was OK with that. And, you know, after a while, I kind of, you know, learned, you know, that, you know, you can't feel guilty forever. But it, it was hard at first, for sure. And I think, you know, all these years later, you know, my mom, I think she's dealt with it pretty good. I even know I even think now, though, she gets a little bit yeah. sad. I can see it in her face. But. Right. It's tough, you know. I think it's always sad to see your kid who used to be able to walk in a wheelchair. And I don't I don't think it's ever easy or you ever become a hundred percent okay with it as a parent because you always want to see your kid, you know, healthy. But I know my stepdad's really good. He reminds my mom, just be glad that Tiffany's here. She could have been dead. And so sometimes you need that reminder as a parent too, because you know, paralysis a long time ago with the death sentence, you know. So. Right. Well, no, that's a that's a great point. And it kind of leads me into um, kind of something that I did want to ask is when you obviously you had this injury early on in high school, but you kind yeah. of found a way to to push through and finish out your high school career. I mean, I even have here in our, in our notes that you were mentoring young women in the SCI community uh, during that time. And you found your way to go to college and you went to Augsburg, which is a... Uh, a rival school of the University of St. Thomas. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, but I guess wh what was it that allowed you to kind of push forward? Where, at what point did you kind of hit that, that turning point in which you were like, I'm going to run with this and make the most out of it? Oh, a lot of, that's a lot of things. First was the internet. <laughs> hmm. I was, um, I think, you know, back way back in when I was in high school and I was bored at home in my wheelchair and I got the little mailer in the mail. Hey, you can sign up for AOL. Here's your disc. You know, um, <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> and I got myself a computer from my uh, benefit that had happened after my injury. So I got this big Packard bell in my bedroom. <laughs> and so I was set up with this computer and my AOL account and I started going online. And, you know, for me back, it was like early days of the internet. No, I didn't really, there was no 
you know, websites to go on. So I was out and about just kind of going on AOL and I had my profile talking about how I was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that kind of started me meeting other girls who were also paralyzed and it just became this really cool thing online. And I decided to start a website. Uh, once I realized how to figure out how to do it, and that took me about five years once I started using the computer a lot. But when I went to, um, Camp Courage, you know, um, it was great because I met this girl who was blind and we became friends and I'm like, I have a friend now. It's great. And um, we she would hang out and sleep over at my house. And then while I was there, though, one girl that I met that really changed my life, her name was Steph. And she and I were like both paralyzed, newly paralyzed. And she and I became like best friends. And she was one of these girls that was kind of a bad girl. And she was like, you should come hang out with us. And I'm like, me? You want me to hang out with you? I'm <laughs> But they let me, and it was this awesome friendship. And unfortunately, she, she passed away in, two, uh, gosh, 2005. She had a kidney failure that had nothing to do with her paralysis. Oh. and Really, really heartbreaking for me. But she was the best. And so we had this, like, awesome friendship, and she showed me, like, how to be um, – what's the word kind of tough and kind of mm. badass if I can say that on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was really afraid of going out in my wheelchair and afraid of what the world would think of me and how I'd be perceived. Cause I just was so uncomfortable in my wheelchair. I just could not get comfortable in it. Yeah. And she was like, this personality was like, no, you're going to come with me. We're going to get on the city bus together. And if nobody likes it, they can get out of our way. And that was kind of like her personality. I was like, okay, she's fine. <laughs> so I kind of her lead. And after our friendship, she pretty much wore off on me. And I think if there's a God, she was definitely put in my life for a reason because she made me tough, you know, and like realized that you can't like be afraid. Even if you're in a chair, you know, you have to get out there and do your life. So she was amazing. And then, you know, and then it slowly started, you know, I realized in college, you know, that I could maybe help people online. And so I started, uh, you know, my website, Beauty Ability, which I thought was a fun name, beautyability.com. Because for me, I think feeling ugly, too, was a big problem when I was a little in high school or I was like, no one's going to like me and no one's going to think I'm cute anymore. Who, who the hell would want to be with a girl in a wheelchair? This is never going to be good for me. And so I had, you know, in high school did not really help out with that because I, I didn't really have any experience dating in high school. I didn't go to prom or anything. So I didn't really think any guys were ever going to like me, but I don't know if it was like a self-esteem issue or whatever, but that was just me being silly. And so finally, you know, in college I started dating and stuff and, I started realizing that, you know, I didn't have to be depressed and that I could maybe one day get married or have a family, but, you know, or just do something that wasn't like sitting at home looking out the window in my wheelchair because God forbid, oh, nobody wants to be with someone in a wheelchair. Like I really thought the life was over for me and that was wrong. And I think, but a lot of people do think that when they first are injured, they think, that's the end of the line for my life. How can I have a good life in a wheelchair? Right. This is going to just be a horrible life. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not easy, but there is a, uh, you can still have a great life. You can, you really can. And that's not some cheesy motivational sentiment by any means. Um, but it's hard to really see that yeah. it really, really is. But it took me many years. Well, it's a, so in that, and I think all, well, yeah, being a teenager made it even yeah. harder. I think, well, I think it's fun. It's interesting to hear you talk about your self-confidence developing, because I think that's, uh, it, it takes a while to get comfortable with it. Uh, it sounds like, and, and. And then you get exposure to your friend who's sort of out there pressing the envelope and it helps build up your self-confidence and your self-esteem and it becomes infectious and, and goes from there. Yeah, it's pretty great. I, I, I was really blessed to have those people that I met. And I think a lot of people who are in chairs, who have been paralyzed, who are paralyzed, have these similar stories where they've met someone in rehab or met someone in a chair that showed them how to do things and really changed their life. And that's really important. Uh, so if you know someone with this you know, spinal cord injury, make sure to get them into some peer mentoring thing because it really is life changing. It really is. So, yeah. Well, perfect. I think that just about wraps us up here for part one. So um, in part two, we're going to try and kind of explore where where life has taken you after the injury and kind of really 
what what you've been driving towards with with your career and everything that you've gotten involved with in the SCI community. So um, thank you, Tiffany, again for joining us and everybody watching at home. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe and like icon so that you know when new episodes drop. If you're listening to the podcast on your favorite platform, you can always give us a follow. Otherwise, we will see you in part two one month from today. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Tiffany.